on Kit 141A, Welcome to Master the World. Evan, we're going to start you off. Oh, actually, Tim, actually, we're, we're going to start you off no, with Tim the first off one today. today. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, happy Friday, wherever you are. And this is a great way to end the week, of course. Uh, you know, just a couple of thoughts before we get started. And I think Madeline always uh, goes first, and she's uh, consistent about saying things like, uh, as we taste through these wines, we're certainly working with a grid that Evan and uh, we developed some years ago. And uh, the, the wines show differently depending on when you taste them. And wines, of course, are a living thing in the bottle, so they change. So don't be surprised if how we're describing the wines doesn't exactly fit the grid that's printed. But obviously, we're going to hit a lot of commonalities in terms of the aromas and flavors, and certainly when we talk about the structure. Okay. All right, with that, let's get started. And this is wine number one, the first of two white wines. Everybody, as you take a look at the glass over a white background, this wine's got, uh, you know, some color. So, you know, in terms of the color, I'm going to call it mm, yellow instead of straw. I would say it's medium. Uh, some highlights, it's got a tiny bit of green. And my glass has some bubbles in it. And the bubbles are dissolved CO2, carbon dioxide, and those are probably from CO2 being added as a preservative at the time of bottling, or they could be from fermentation. And the wine is probably fairly youthful. You know, depth of color in, in white wine can come from a number of things. It can come from the wine being old, from the wine being aged at oak, from the wine seeing skin contact for a length of time, or from Botrytis grapes, which is a mold. And Botrytis, of course, is responsible uh, in terms of quality of fruit for most of the non-fortified great dessert wines out there. Okay, all that said, uh, the last thing we'll do is we'll swirl the glass or you can rotate it slowly like that. And uh, the tears, legs, viscosity, et cetera, is medium plus is practically high. I also wanna point out one more thing in my particular glass is that there's tartaric, tartaric acid crystals, right? So there's tiny little crystals at the end Tartaric acid is the most important of the four primary acids in wine. And uh, usually, you know, winemakers don't want to deal with customers freaking out. <laughs> I could tell you a story that one time as a sommelier on the floor, of when I served a, a bottle of French white wine to a table, a woman accused me of putting toenails in her wine. And I assured her, madam, <laughs> You know, they're going to magically disappear in a few minutes, which they did once the wine warmed up. Okay, sorry, rabbit hole. Uh, what else can we say about that? Yeah, tartaric acid crystals, which means the wine is probably unfined and unfiltered and certainly not cold stabilized, which is where you take the temp down and precipitate mm -hmm. all those out before you bottle. Okay, on to the nose, which is the main event. Oh, and this smells wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of fruit here. So, you know, starting at the top, so there's sweet citrus. The citrus here is not tart. So it's mandarin and orange and tangerine, maybe a little bit of lime. Otherwise, there's stone fruit. So peach, both yellow and white, and there's some uh, apricot and some nectarine. It's really stone fruit type dominant. And then there's also some really ripe yellow apple and some brown pear. And everything is fresh and ripe. So there's nothing too tart about this, which makes me suspicious about the climate where the grapes were grown. Uh, in terms of non-fruit, really the most important thing, and it's a dominant thing on the nose of the wine, is flowers, is floral. And here it's honeysuckle, uh, it's like peach blossoms, it's freesia, it's white flowers, and it's really pretty. But the, the floral component is almost as dominant as the fruit, and the flowers are all fresh. Uh, what else about it? You know, there's a hint of ginger and ginger root about it that adds a bit of spice and that goes along with the honey. Also, there's some white mushrooms and uh, maybe a little bit of saffron too and verbena, kind of a lemony herbal quality. And then in terms of earth and mineral, I mean, there are touches. There's a touch of dusty mineral type quality and with a mushroom, a little bit of turned earth, but there's really not much. This is really fruit forward and fruit dominant. And then finally, there's little if any oak on this at all. So there's no vanilla spices, et cetera, et cetera. Now that said, this wine could have been aged and used oak for some time, in which case we'll be able to taste that. Okay, and then on the palate. Mm. 
Wow. So this is just utterly delicious. All mm -hmm. the fruit I'm talking about holds through. The peach, apricot, nectarine, yellow apple, tangerine, mandarin. There's also a little tropical fruit here. I didn't get so much on the nose like pineapple <laughs> and kiwi. Um, and there's a little bit of tart lime on the finish. So like most white wines, the fruit tartens up a bit from the nose to the palate, okay? Other things on here, the verbena, the saffron, little bit of mushroom, things like that, all those hold true. Uh, this wine, it just texturally is, you know, just the result of some really good winemaking because the wine is complete. It's seamless in terms of the fruit, the middle of the wine and the finish, which is really quite long. In terms of the structure, taste it again, please. Mm. That's a yum. The wine's delicious. Okay. Um, acid salivary glands are working. It's medium plus. The alcohol is, I think, close to high. It's right around 14% is what it feels like. I can feel it right down in here, the heat. Also, the ripeness of the fruit. You connect those dots. If you have really ripe fruit, you got high alcohol. What else about it? There's some phenolic bitterness in the finish. It's mm -hmm. like all the skins. Right? Uh, the finish itself is long and the complexity is medium plus. Okay, Li Meng, we need our palate. Tim, I just got to add one thing. I wish that you were in my head talking the entire time that I taste. You you're don't so, want my voice in your head. You're, you're, you're so efficient with tasting, it's amazing. All right, I'm going to put out the poll right here and I'm going to turn the slide. Mm. Okay. So, everybody, as you're looking at the Great Fridays, you've got the first one, Pinot Grigio. Uh, that is semi-aromatic. And then you've got two full-on aromatic grapes, Torrentes and Viognier or Viognier blend. And then of course, if you're gonna go the Pinot Grigio route, you've got Northern Italy, with the really good wines are from Alto Adige. Uh, Viognier blend or the Viognier can be from France, from the Northern Rhone, in which case it could be Condrieu. Or if it's from a you know, non-European type country, it could be the US and California, or it could be Australia where more Viognier is grown and made than anywhere. Uh, Torrentes, of course, we would connect the dots into Salta, into Argentina. So uh, as Li Meng has just typed into the chat, remember, just vote. This is anonymous, just go for it. Um, yeah, the first one is always hard. I always see this 10% yeah. of people are in 20. <laughs> we're only at 22% people. So oh, come on. can we you get can to it. at least 60? Pick okay. a number, 25% chance or 33% chance of getting it right, really. Right. So, you know, this is, you know, conclusions like this are a decision tree on all the information that you've just put together. And the two most important things are the impact compounds, which are a smaller subset of aromas and flavors and the flowers is one of the important ones, okay? That's uh, terpenes, monoterpenes, okay? That you get in aromatic grapes. So here's so, our results. We've got Pinot Grigio weighing at 9%, Torrentes at 36%, Viognier blend at 45%, and other at 9%. And we've got France at 27%, Argentina for the Torrentes people, no doubt. And then California at 27%, okay? So you can see how this kind of mixes and matches. Uh, the, the big question, the first thing you have to, use, have to ask yourself is how earthy and how minerally is this wine? And how did I make a big deal out of it or not? And the answer is no, I really didn't. I made a big deal out of how gorgeous and delicious the fruit was and really the perfumed of all the floral qualities. So you've got a full on aromatic grape from the new world. And so uh, let's see what we have, okay? All right, I'm gonna, um, you can close your polls out and I'm going to go to the next slide, which will have our Google Earth. Yeah, and, and as we take our little, you know, galactic journey here, you know, something also, would you, something you can expect in white wine, if you've got a lot of floral qualities, it is an aromatic grape, right? And Torrentes and Vignet were both aromatic grapes, but with that, you will have, skin contact and phenolic bitterness. So those are two things that always go hand in hand. And sure enough, we are in, it looks like, the West Coast. Heaven, maybe not too far from you. No, no, and a couple of hours just, maybe. Looks like if yeah, I'm sitting yeah. here looking at the map. Couple yeah, and a, and a really gorgeous place to visit. And we're gonna be in Santa Inez Valley in Santa Barbara County. This is the Andrew Murray Vineyards. Uh, Andrew Murray to me, and I've known him for a long time, uh, one of the original quote unquote Rhone Rangers, uh, who's been making, you know, brilliant Rhone styled wines, both red and white and pink 
for decades, right? And I remember visiting, you know, his winery for the first time in the earlier mid nineties and just being so impressed is as much as anything for how absolutely spot on the varietals were because he makes obviously Syrah, which is his first love, this beautiful Viognier. He also makes, uh, you know, white blend with some Roussan and Grenache Blanc and other Chateauneuf-like red blends. But I think he's just, for winemakers dealing with round grapes in California, he's got a death touch. And the texture, as witnessed by this VOD, is just beautiful. It's shimmering and just delicious. All right, so here we go. We've got the Andrew Murray. This is the 2021 Viognier. And looking at the website, they don't use oak on the wine. And frankly, this is a good example of why you don't need to put Viognier in wood, because it has more than enough on its own you know, to stand without it. Yeah. So Tim, here's a question. Um, Christy had Muscadet mm. uh, initially. What, what do you think of that vote? Is it because of the floral, you know, aspects of the wine? Well, okay. So Christy, that's, you know, there's an interesting point. Uh, the saline quality, which you could probably get in the bid palette. First of all, you know, Muscadet, you know, Muscadet just, it doesn't have this much fruit. And it's not delicious fruit and succulent and amazing. And it's not floral. Uh, Muscadet is a fairly, it's a neutral grape, right? Melon mm -hmm. de Bourgogne. And the reason they do lees aging with it is because it adds texture. Because otherwise the wine is, is acidic and straightforward. Hence why it's such a great shellfish and aperitif wine. But this wine has so much in terms of floral and, and like the whole cornucopia of fruit. Mm -hmm. um, and Tim, is, is Viognier considered a aromatic wine? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Viognier is in the family of Torrentes. That was a possibility is another one. You've also got uh, Gewurztraminer and you've got Muscat in all of its forms. Great. So those are the four main players, the fully aromatic grape. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Akeem is asking, are you thinking Riesling? Yeah, but Akeem, Riesling is just not this floral and it doesn't have phenolic bitterness and it's got high acid. And, uh, you know, this has elevated medium plus acidity, but if you have this much fruit, it's really difficult to have ripe fruit like this and high acid at the same time. Mm -hmm. Great. Awesome. All right, we'll keep going on this, some photos to show Andrew Murray's beautiful vineyard. That night, uh, can you describe what that darkness is? What are they doing over yeah, there? Yeah, sure. You know, it's actually not only common for Santa Barbara County, but many places in the North Coast too, where you're harvesting at night because you want the fruit itself to be cool, the internal temperature. Because what you're trying to do is A, avoid the heat of the day. But not only that, you want to get the fruit into the winery at a cool temperature. So when you start the whole process of fermentation, it's going to start off at a cooler temperature versus a warmer, which means the whole thing is going to be longer and more gentle, more gradual. And, you know, with white wine fermentation, the temperatures are always in the 60, mid 60s range. And you want it to be slow because that's how you retain all the aromatics. If it gets warmer, you tend to lose them. And there's Andrew and his family and uh, just fantastic people. Yeah. Um, it's because we got another Riesling comment. Tim, did you get any of the petrol TDN on this wine at all? No, no, really don't. You know, I think that's, uh, if anything, the wine is just so over overtly floral. And if anybody's having trouble with the flowers, you know, sometimes if you put your nose all the way in the glass, you go right past them. So monoterpenes, they tend to be very volatile aromatics. They tend to be among the first molecules that evaporate in the whole process, the, you know, the evolution of the wine. And so they're, they're above the glass. I mean, that's why they leap out because they're evaporating really quickly. So, uh, yeah, but don't confuse that with, uh, with uh, petrol, TDN. And obviously the easiest way to do that is put a Riesling next to Viognier. And yeah, it's a huge, huge difference. Yeah, but good point. Thank you. All right, Evan, we're on to you for wine number two. Yeah, happy Earth Day to everybody too. I know it's 24 yeah. hours early, but if you pick up earthiness in all of your wines today, although you may <laughs> be incorrect, nobody's gonna be mad because we have to take care of uh, take care of our Earth. Uh, uh, yeah, I think Tim, what you kicked off with, which I just think is worth reiteration, is that you know when these wines are tasted, when these wines are gritted, when these wines are are, are put out there, um, it is that snapshot in time, and we know 
Um, some days are Earth Day, some days are fruit days, et cetera. So your palate's going to change every single day. In fact, if you were to taste three wines side by side, your favorite might change from one day to another just because the way you perceive it, everything that's uh, in your world, et cetera, is going to be there. So, so if you're not scoring and tracking 100% to what's in the grid, do not fret, do not freak, do not think it's you or whatever. Um, it, you know, I might score the wines differently today as does Tim, just in terms of the way we're speaking about them. Yeah vis-a-vis -vis that. So with that said, let's move into the second glass. And this uh, glass of wine is clearly different uh, than the first wine. You know, from a visual standpoint, obviously the color is not quite as rich, nearly as deep, nearly as thick as the other one was. This wine definitely has some color to it, which could again speak to age. It could speak to grape variety, uh, ergo possibility some skin contact. Um, it could speak to climate and certainly it could speak to oak aging, but it, it doesn't have the richness there. Having said that, I would never be uh, caught placing, you know, $100 on 14 red just on color because uh, color itself is a part of the ingredient that's there. As I swirl the wine and look at it, uh, it doesn't have as much viscosity, richness or thickness of volume in the glass as the first wine did, which all that would tell me at this point in time is maybe it's less alcoholic, maybe there's uh, less um, skin skins, although there's very rarely skins there, but there could have been skins in the first one. In fact, I'm probably sure there were, whereas this one there might be, et cetera, et cetera. But again, don't get too way too hung up on it. As uh, Tim said before, the main event is always in the nose. If you've ever had hay fever or cold, you know that to be true as well. And I always love for a few elements in my wine, uh, F for fruit, E for earth, and W for wood and anything else that's there. And right off the bat, I'm getting this sort of struggle, this tug there between sort of an interesting um, mineral character and an interesting, almost sort of slightly slatyish character, yet at the same time, um, interesting fruit elements there. And the fruit elements there are sort of on the tart side. I'm getting some quince, I'm getting some apple flavors. Uh, I'm getting some grapefruity, uh, almost like flavors. And then underneath that, I'm getting uh, some stone fruit, but the stone fruit there, probably more yellow plum, maybe some uh, other stone fruit characters, but definitely more on the underripe side. Uh, this is a fairly shrill nose to it. And even the citrus elements that are there are relatively pithy. Um, they're not necessarily pure. So it's the fruit character that's closest to the skin that gives you just a slight element of astringency to it and bitterness. But by the same token, the organic or so-called fruit elements there, and I put anything that comes out of the ground in that category, are not limited to pure fruit. Uh, as Tim talked about before, there's some floral elements, certainly more in the first wine than this wine. But again, there are some sort of citrus blossomy elements there. And then there is this whole uh, genre of um, vegetative things. So I'm picking up radish, daikon, I'm picking up a little bit of ginger once again, and then I'm picking up some interesting um, spice characters to it. There's a little bit of caraway, um, a soft amount of almost uh, cumin to it. And then in the back, um, herbal, again, uh, sort of uh, a lemony character, a lemon verbena -ish thing, a little bit of chamomile, like tea or tea leaf, white tea leaf type thing. And then this mineral thing. And then uh, just an undercurrent of other things. So along with that caraway, I'm finding a peppery character, a two more white pepper than black pepper, and uh, just strong minerality, which suggests to me that when I try this one, it's going to be um, a little bit on the leaner side. Let's go ahead and try it if you haven't done so already. Ooh, and coming off of that first wine, this wine is a little bit more on the electric side, a little bit zestier, a little bit crunchier as far as its acids go. The acid itself really permeates and penetrates the back of your palate. And um, I don't know if any of you are getting it, but I'm noticing this hint almost, I'm old enough to say it, so I will, that like, remember when you were back in school and things were done on chalkboards, not smart boards like they were done in the past? And if your chalk eraser was full and you clapped them there to get the chalk dust off of it. Any chalk dust that ended up going into your mouth, if you were sitting there helping the teacher uh, and coated your mouth, that's the same sensation you get in this back of the wine. So sometimes a sort of chalky, earthy, flinty character can manifest itself in white wines as much texturally as it does flavor-wise here. And this wine has a little bit of a soft, almost talky grip on the back of your palate, which could be a combination of leaves, it could be a combination of minerality, the two of them conflated, et cetera. The structure on it, 
It's probably about medium, medium plus in body. Acid is high. Uh, it is obviously bone dry uh, and it finishes quite long. If you can still taste it after I'm talking and talking and talking, that means it's a long wine, which is usually a good sign of quality. So when you're asking yourself the desert island question, what wine should I take to the desert island, Evan? This would be a wine you could, you could certainly consider. Um, really lean, long, delicious, uh, needs some food, um, but really, really good. Tasty yeah. stuff. So Tasty what do we what we have here as far as choices go uh, in terms of grapes? We're, we're clearly in a very different direction than we were pr before with uh, Tim's Viognier or Viognier blend. Here we could have uh, an Albarino or Albarino. And by the way, those at times can be blend as well, too. Those tend to be very stony in nature, very citrusy as well, depending on if the Portuguese or the Spanish side of the world or even an Aussie part of the world. Grunewald Liner, uh, the, the grape that is signature of Austria um, and most prominent white grape, certainly in Austria. Pinot Gris or Grigio always seems to uh, to show up here. And again, because sort of sort of an interesting minerally neutrality to it, it could go a lot of places, not super aromatic as Tim mentioned. Then of course, we have our other friends. And then the data points that connect below. Uh, if you were in Austria, you probably could be Pinot Gris Grigio or Gruner Veltliner. If you're in Spain, you're probably in the Albarino range. If you're in New Zealand, you could be any of the above, ditto in the USA, and then you could fill in with a few players to be named later, probably two of whom will be in the outfield when the Giants take on the Mets tonight at Oracle Park, because we have so many injuries right now. I, anyway. I just want to I just want to say if after two wines, you're feeling a little stressed that this was a difficult tasting, don't worry. I know everything that goes into our bottles and I get confused because I you know, don't remember what exactly goes into each kit. And it's, it's sometimes just exciting for me to hear what Evan and Tim are tasting in these wines. Um, and I hope that you're not, you know, take a chance on this voting, um, but don't feel like, oh my gosh, I must be so dumb for not getting it. It's, this is not easy for everyone to just get it right away. Yeah, especially remember the, if you're not used to these wines. Kits by definition are meant to be are, are meant to be stretches. They're meant to be aspirational. You don't want us to just give you a Chardonnay and a Sauvignon Blanc or this and that every single time, um, but to really help you aspirationally grow your palate, learn your palate, and really be comfortable and free fall in the fact that the examples that we do select here for you are really um, solid examples of what they are. So if something is new to you, hit save in your head, put it there as a reference point for the future and know um, in the future that as you taste other examples of that, you always have something to harken back on to do it. So um, I see, I see a little encouragement helped move us up another 20%. <laughs> Thank you, you very much for voting. There Again, it's anonymous. I'm going to end. Or you could be, a, be, be from Chicago, vote early, vote often, vote more than once. Anyway, <laughs> Uh, as we're looking here, what our choices are, I, I think we've ended up in some good places. Uh, a number of you picked uh, Albarino, a more greater number of you, in fact, almost two thirds of you picked our friend Gruna Fadliner, a few Pinot Grigio, and then a couple of others. The others would be always interesting to hear where you are. Of course, Gruner um, follows almost a one for one tracking there with Austria, but I would um, commend you to think about or recommend you to think about that Gruner, which was a grape that was pretty much exclusively associated with, uh, with the state of, uh, or the state, the country of Austria before. You can not find it in New Zealand. You can find it in Australia. You can find it here in California, et cetera. So a lot of these grapes are becoming much more international by both um, interest of consumers, but also climates and a number of other things. And then Spain, of course, uh, being our choice today for 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 our Albarino, as was New Zealand. Nobody ended up in New Zealand, and a couple for USA. So that's I, I think that we're we're firmly in the old world in this voting scheme. So let's see if people which makes are sense right. based on the structure, uh, yeah. the acid levels makes sense based on that mineral, both aroma and the textural elements that are there. So um, if you found yourself in the old world, not just by choice but also by conviction. Um, you're probably in a pretty good spot. So as we sort of work our way back out on our Battlestar Galactica, as Tim likes to call it, and head, uh, head elsewhere, we're clearly not in California anymore, or Kansas for that matter, Dorothy, as we move through other places. And we're probably going to find ourselves as uh, the structure of the wine suggested into some place, probably more in the more traditional old world sense. And as we land in Europe, that's where we're going. And as we land uh, off of Spain, because remember Spain's out on that West Coast there, uh, we're blending further inland and probably more towards Central 
uh, West Central Europe, if you will, and specifically in Austria. And we're going to end up in a beautiful part of that country, uh, Vineland specifically. I always think it's cool that the wine area is called Vineland. And more specifically, in an area called uh, Niederösterreich, which is a larger but very well-known wine area within there. And then more specifically in the subzone of Kamptal. Uh, and Kamptal is uh, very associated not only with high-quality Austrian wines, such as that of Leumer, which we'll talk about momentarily, but also very specifically with Gruner Veltliner. In fact, this particular appellation, uh, which has a, a, an interesting soil base of Luss, which is sort of that very dusty uh, volcanic leftover, sands and gravels, uh, is very conducive, a uh, true Gruner Veltliner, which is why not only is Comptal uh, famous for this grape, but it literally is home to over 50% of the Gruner Veltliner planted in Austria, which is an interesting factoid for you to impress your friends. Um, the area uh, that is the largest town, if you will, you know, we have, I don't know, St. Helena in Napa, we have Healdsburg in, in, in Santa Rosa or uh, Healdsburg in Sonoma County. And they have Langenloy uh, in, in Kamptal, and that is the largest and most principal wine area of Austria as well, too. Kamptal, of course, takes its name from the Comp River, which is uh, effectively opens up into the Danube later. So Comptal or Comp River and all that, and it goes right through, through that particular place. This wine, as I alluded to earlier, is made by um, Fred Leumer and the Leumer family. Fred took over from his father uh, in 1988 and has really taken to the, the winery to the next level. Um, they were dabbling in um, organics. Um, he took it fully biodynamic in 2006 and is actually one of the leading lights in the whole biodynamic movement these days contemporarily. Uh, in Austria, we know that Rudolf Steiner in Austria sort of got it started, but Fred is really through biodyne, uh, become kind of a uh, an amazing light for that movement there. He's very international by nature. If you've ever seen a picture of the winery before, it looks like a big black cube sitting in the middle of the vineyard. Whether that was uh, spawned by him going to see Derenberg, I don't know or not. And uh, it's a very good value, as you can see there as well. The quality level that you can get at $25 is pretty exceptional. What I really like about this wine, though, is how um, emblematic it is of what Gruner Veltliner is all about. So the signature flavors that we talked about, the sort of tartar citric pithy characters, that sort of radishy character, that pepperiness that is at once sort of somewhere between white pepper and arugula, that underlayer of caraway. There's almost like a celeriac or celery root character that we talk about to it. All of those with that leanness to it, uh, that brightness to it are, are, are spot on for what this particular um, grape variety is all about. And this is just a basic one. Um, it should be pointed out that so many of the better uh, Gruners, very much like Riesling, in both Austria and Germany next door, are very site-specific. Um, in this case, they're coming from Erstelagens, or single vineyards that are there, of which the uh, Leumer family has either five or six. I don't remember what I uh, read, or I can't read my writing one way or the other. But this is a great, uh, see the black cube? It looks like you could be at Derenberg, except that you're in Austria, right? And not quite as many layers, but it, it, it's a really um, uh, lovely property. It's a lovely site, and consistently, um, they're considered to be an, um, the producers. That's Fred uh, on on the, on the left hand side, and his, his winemaker David on the right, cellar master. But what's really important to note here is year in and year out, they are considered to be probably amongst the leaders in this grape variety. I mean, they are considered to be a touchstone. They are good on you, Lori, two for two so far. We love it. Um, but anyway, if, you're, if you've never had a Gruner Veltliner before, this is a great one to um, hit save on and put in your memory banks because um, it really is a great example of it. I'll defer to Tim as he as we move to wine three on any other comments that he may have on it. But Let I me jump in with one, one question, Evan. A question. Uh, or a yes, so uh, on Oak Chardonnay, what do you think of that call? Um, Akeem is saying that he got apples and maybe pineapples on the finish and thought that it was Monterey. Mm -hmm. uh, can you see? I'm not getting any tropical elements on it. So, and if they are, 
They're not going to be in the pineapple vein unless that pineapple will really enter up. Maybe starfruit, something like uber tart or something like that is possible. But I really do think this is more in sort of that sort of combo tree fruit vein, which would probably lead me away from the, from the tropical notes there. Un oak Chardonnay would not be nearly as interesting as this. Um, Chardonnay is a, a fairly non-aromatic, relatively neutral grape by which everything that we do to it from malolactic fermentation to choice of vessel, oxidation, et cetera, is going to be there. Where you may have picked up just a little bit of a Chardonnay clue is there is sort of a backdrop of sort of a nutty sesame seed, marzipani character because this wine has spent about 30% of its time in larger oak and all of its time in the contact with the leaves. And as the leaves do break down a little bit over time, they are going to give you kind of a nutty character. But the flavor profile itself um, is definitely, at least to me, not really super Chardonnay-ish in character. Excellent. All right. Number Tim, anything, anything I got wrong there? Anything you'd no, no. before you hit uh, you know, one, I would three? just say, if I can add to your thoughts, Evan, uh, so I came, you know, uh, I think you what will help you is, is that, you know, white wines generally have tree fruit, orchard fruit, like apple and pear and citrus, right? So that's common, a common denominator. It's not going to help you with great variety of recognition. What will is Evan really nailed the description of the wine in terms of all the non-fruit things, the flowers, uh, the white pepper, the, all the, 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 the not vegetal, but all the like uh, green botanical type things like there's radish and daikon and lentils and parsley and on and on and on. And you only find those in a Gruner Veltliner, that whole combination. Mm -hmm. And even the palate to me tastes like white pepper. And it's very, very mineral driven. And, you know, taste it next to the Viognier now, now that you have both wines under your belt. And you can see one is fully aromatic, the Viognier, the other one is semi-aromatic, the Gruner Veltliner. And you can see huge differences, but especially the old world, new world thing, how much mineral is in the Gruner versus the Viognier, which is practically none. Anyway, just a thought. Very helpful, Tim. Here All right. We go. Now we're on to wine number three. So we're into the red wine universe here. And let's take a look at our questions, right? I didn't do that last time. So the first thing is, is look at the depth of color. And what does it tell you about the, the possible potential grape varieties in which the wine was made? Are they thinner skin, lighter pigmented, deeper pigmented, you know, thicker skinned? And then uh, what else? What might that tell you about the climate and where they grow thinner skinned grape versus thicker skinned grapes? And then what are the most important non-fruit aromas? Because Again, the point I just made, you know, all wines have fruit, right? What is important once you get past identifying fruit, which everybody disagrees on, by the way, is that the quality of the fruit and how ripe or tart is it? And then these non-fruit, you know, herbal, spicy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, things. Those are important. And then finally the structure, okay? And then the last point is about the structure. How do the, how do the wine structural levels reflect the climate where the grapes were grown, okay? And that really has to do with a push-pull of the alcohol and the acid together. Wherever you have higher alcohol, you have less acid, okay? And then wherever you have restrained alcohol, you have higher acid. All right, let's get going. With that, and the first point, take a look at the wine, and ah, I can see through the glass. I can read through it. So it's, I would not quite translucent, but I would call this a medium minus ruby, but the color is also a little evolved, yeah? So there's definitely some garnet in it, and so I would call this medium ruby, and it lightens up to the rim, uh, a kind of a sandalwood color or salmon, okay? All right, what else about it? Um, between the clarity, the color, in terms of legs, tears, marangoni, la -di da that's a solid medium plus, yeah? So I think the Viognier even had higher alcohol in this wine, yeah? And there's really no staining of the tears, which once again connects to the dot that there's not a great deal of depth in the color. Okay, on to the nose. Ooh, and there's lots of stuff going on here. So again, we're gonna start with the fruit. And when I talk about red wines, I generally start with the categories of the color of the fruit. So I'm gonna start with red fruit first. And red fruit usually is tartar and uh, here we've got, you know, your basic sour red cherry, but we've also got uh, things like uh, red plum and we've got uh, cranberry and, uh, and then there's some dark fruit too. And, th and those, by the way, I would call them tart and ripe and fresh just on the edge of evolving. And again, that connects to the advanced in the color in the rim. What else? There's some dark fruit here, uh, but these are darker fruits that have lift, that have acidity. So there's blackberry and black raspberry maybe a little black plum. 
and, and once again, I'm, I'm saying it's fresh and ripe, but it's, you know, just, uh, it's evolving, right? <laughs> and there's no blue fruit and there's no raisinated or dry fruit, okay. And then on the non-fruit, starting above the glass, there's really some pretty uh, rose petals and also a little bit of lavender, right? And those are fresh. And then there's quite a bit of non-fruit in terms of the green herbal type family. I'd say there's some bay laurel, there's some tea and bergamot. And what else is there? There's some star anise, a little bit of ginger too, and red licorice for sure, okay? And what else? Hmm. In terms of earth and mineral, yes to both, but you know, I think the fruit outweighs things here. So, but earth and mineral, I think there's a soil, turn soil quality that goes with mushrooms. There's also a mineral like whetstone quality. And then beyond that, there's some uh, oak in terms of winemaking regimen. It's medium use here. So you do have spices. I've got some cocoa powder, oh, some cinnamon. And remember I mentioned sandalwood on the color. Well, it smells like sandalwood, yeah. And to me, that's a mix of used and new oak together, predominantly used. And then there's kind of like a, um, a nutty almond uh, marzipan quality, which is oxidation, which is again, speaks to used oak. And then finally, in terms of winemaking, there is some stemmy green type her herbal qualities. And that's gonna you know, hint at partial whole cluster or whole cluster together. In terms of the palate, I'm gonna go taste it for structure. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So the wine it turns tartar on the palate, but you give this lovely impression of ripe fruit in the beginning that turns tart on the finish. And um, the wine is more herbal, especially the tea and bergamot and the laurel. And then the structure, the wine is dry. Uh, acid is medium plus, alcohol is medium plus, and the tannins are medium. The tannins are really fine and soft and gentle. Mm, speaks to the grape variety, definitely. Uh, the finish is medium plus and the complexity is medium plus. Um, so, you know, Scott, you're asking, what might I be mistaking for prune? I'm not sure. That could be a little combination of the fruit and the herbal qualities together. If you have prune type notes in a wine, you're gonna have high alcohol uh, because if you have grapes in the first stages of raisination and you press that juice, it's got a lot of sugar and that gives you a lot of alcohol. Okay, here we are. Your votes, Gamay, Pinot Noir and Dolcetto. Hmm, okay, so those are three, you know, kind of related grapes in terms of their weight and their intensity maybe their color, winemaking techniques could be different for them. If you're in the Dolcetto camp, you're in Piedmont, Northwestern Italy. If you're Gamay, you're probably in the Beaujolais camp, which is Southern Burgundy in France. And what else? You've got Pinot Noir, which could be from any number of places. In which case then you ask yourself, you know, ripeness of fruit and then how earthy is the wine? To me, what this wine has is a lot of delicious fruit, a lot of herbal qualities, some earth and mineral, and then the use of oak, okay? All right, so those are your choices. Please vote, don't be bashful. It's completely anonymous. Yes. No one's gonna be sitting in the back going, oh, so-and-so got this right or got this wrong. Oh, it's a wonderful opportunity that. to uh, put yourself out there and uh, take a stand on something. And as um, we always know that the only way you get better uh, is to try. The only way you mm -hmm. get better at times is to make a mistake. And if yes. you only vote when you're right, well, that's going to be a hard thing to do because we don't really know if we're right. We don't try. Um, Tim, we have about a 50-50 coming in on new world versus old world. Maybe a hint there. Mm. Well, okay. You know, so how much of a deal did I make about the fruit versus the earth and mineral? Mm. That's really the, the telltale. Yep. Great. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to. Oops. Sorry, I have a camera here. Okay, so let's see if we can end the poll. I think that we have a good quorum and share the results. So, Tim, we've got 64% on the Pinot. Mm -hmm. 
about 30% on the Dolcetto and some on the Gamay, mm -hmm. but um, a slight more on the 60-40 on the uh, old world versus new world. But within that, people are really split between Italy and France. So yep. you kind of have your work cut out. This is a this is a confounding one for some people here. Well, OK, so, you know, can we put this back up and let's yep. talk about it real quickly? Um, if not, I can just there you go. Right. So everybody, you know, Dolcetto, Italian grape, you know, literally it means the little sweet one in Italian. But it's anything but because it's usually bone dry and it's pretty acidic and it has deeper color. And frankly, it has a little bit more tannin. This wine is not very tannic. In fact, for red wine, it has very soft, gentle tannins, which, you know, leads me right away to Pinot Noir. Why is it not Gamay? Just we should cover that because, so, you know, if it's Gamay and it's this color and this weight, you're probably expecting Beaujolais Village, in which case it would have carbonic maceration and it would have stem inclusion. So the fruit would smell very tutti frutti, bubblegummy, banana y, that kind of thing. And then it would be stemmy and it would be dry and would be fairly mineral. This wine to me is not very mineral driven at all. Uh, the, Akeem was asking about, you know, uh, Burgundy, the Cote de Nuit and Pinot Noir. And Akeem, the only thing is, is it's got a lot of lovely fruit. Uh, the stem tannins are kind of in the background and it's really not very earthy. And so uh, the votes also, we have Oregon and then we have New Zealand. So let's reveal where we are and let's talk about why it's where it's, where, why it's from. Why it is <laughs> from where it is from. You yeah. know what I mean, even though <laughs> I don't. <laughs> so, right, you know, once again, the, the thing about this wine that's also striking you behind all the lovely fruit was probably I reeled off six or eight things about non-fruit herbal things like tea and bergamot and laurel and star anise and red licorice and on and on and on and on. Okay. And so ask yourself, well, would that take me to New Zealand or would it take me to Oregon? And Oregon wines to me have the fruit. They are herbal, but they're also a touch earthy and they're richer wines, right? Generally speaking. So that it's like, to me, the whole package deal, you know, the best Oregon Pinots have a bit of everything in them. And here we are, we are on the South Island and uh, the subregion, and you're actually in central Otago, which now I guess is called the central and we're in Bendigo. And uh, so this is the Mondilo Vineyards and Dominic Mondilo is a chef by training, he trained at Johnson and Wales. He's from Rhode Island. And then in, uh, was it 1982? He moved to New Zealand. And in the span of the next decade, he opened a couple of restaurants and won all sorts of awards. But like many people, he was bitten by the wine bug. And so he went to analogy school, got, got, got a degree. And then in 2001, he and his wife, Allie, opened up their own winery. And the winery is dedicated to making, you know, high quality Pinot Noirs like this one, but also Riesling. And so uh, this to me really speaks to New Zealand and Central Otago Pinot Noir, but I also want to point out something that has really evolved and right in front of our eyes in the last decade. And that once upon a time, you know, when we were teaching New Zealand in Master Sommelier classes, we would say, yeah, Central Otago, tremendous potential for Pinot Noir. One day it's going to be a place where a paradigm for the grape is commonly made. And I think we're there. And the reason we weren't there before is the average age of the vines was so young. And, you know, there, there is something to vines being older because they just produce more complex fruit with just more stuff. And I think this is a perfect example of this because you still got all, all this delicious fruit. But to me, the interest in the wine is, uh, you know, all that herbal uh, and floral qualities that I think are just really pretty and really intriguing about the wine. Mm -hmm. And um, then Kat is asking, and yeah, yep. then Kat, this is typical. It really is. What uh, to me you're getting that you don't get in some of the wine still is that there is so much fruit and the fruit might be confusing and might want to take you to California or Oregon. But to me, the herbal qualities really nail the style of wine. Tim, yeah. what about the vintage in this case? You know, 2018, is that what we normally drink New Zealand Pinots at? Uh, the better ones, yes. It certainly isn't what's on the market. What's on the market now is probably 2019 and even 2020, everybody keeping in mind the fact that you're south of the equator and everything is six months ahead. 
So yes, I think this, you know, this is kind of a sweet spot to start drinking these wines. Also, I mean, the little bit of added age, I mean, we see that in the color of the rim, but also the sandalwood qualities in the wine. So that mm -hmm. little bit of evolution, and it really gives the, the wine an extra dimension. Evan, what do you think? No, I think I think it's nice. I mean, I I I, I believe that these these uh, folks over at Mondillo also hang on to their wine in bottle longer before mm. release. So so they're going to be by definition a vintage or two possibly behind everybody else. That's a gorgeous shot of that part of the world. Mm. And uh, Otago has been. I, I I concur with you that it's an area that we kept talking about it arriving, it arriving, it arriving, and then somehow along the way it just arrived. And the wines have been getting better and better. Uh, but you talked a little bit about, you know, Bendigo, but th what I think is becoming quite interesting over time is that uh, we're starting to get greater uh, familiarity with the subzones there. So mm. whether it's, you know, yeah. uh, Bendigo, Wanaka, et cetera, there's all sorts of interesting areas there uh, high up. Um, again, this is the beauty of it is that although you're high, which gives you, of course, thermal amplitude and everything, there's no point in New Zealand that's more than about 50 miles away from the water. So they're always fresh. They're always mm. bright. They always have a, a, a telltale um refreshing element to them. I just thought it was so wonderful for us to be able to show a wine that had at once some development. You know, uh, we talked a little, somebody mentioned sort of, for lack of better words, where I also don't think there's a pruniness to it, but there is a dried bouquet element to this wine. It's not um, solely a primary wine, which is if we were showing a 20 or 21 right now, it would be all about the fruit. And you'd be guessing about the nuances of development in bottled bouquet and the non- fruit aromas over time uh, where, you know, you might still get those, by the way, in a place that's lower, let's say Marlboro or something like that in New Zealand right now, you're not getting mm -hmm. that in Chicago. Yeah. Um, and this is, I think, just a lovely example. And it also just shows you, you know, we're, and the next couple of wines after this team, I promise you were a little bit oomphier than this one. Elegance, you know, Pinot Noir is all about yeah. elegance and, and the so-called power Pinot um, fetish that's been out there for, for many, many years, I think really misses the mark in terms of great Pinot Noir is about elegance. Great Pinot Noir is about nuance, regardless of provenance. And yeah, I just want to do a shout out. I'm looking at this shot. I can't believe uh, Silco on our team who does the PowerPoints really picked some nice shots in the background with our, our winemaker here. Thank you. Uh, from our very first webinar till now, I think that our uh, shots have really upped the game here. So thank you for that. Um, we have three wines to go. So we're going to power through in the remainder of the time here, guys. Uh, Tim, I believe this is yours. Now this oh, one's no, mine. This is yours, yeah. Evan. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Let's yeah, go back on and to forth. wine number four. We're alternating today. Yeah. Um, and this wine, as you as you look at it, before you even smell it, you can tell that there's going to be a dramatic uh, push up and a volume drive up the hill here. Uh, the wine, whereas the first wine, while it wasn't um, translucent, was much more uh, lighter in, in color and appearance. This wine here definitely pushes the fuller scale to that. Uh, the color is deeper. I wouldn't quite call it opaque, but I would say it is very deep. Uh, the color itself is uh, uh, ruby and it pushes out fairly consistently towards the edge. There's not a lot of what we call rim variation at the edge. And for those of you who are, um, learning about your wines, or if those of you are even um, familiar with wines, you know that the greater the variation from the middle part of the glass to the edge of the glass, generally the older the wine is. Uh, that wines get far more shades of color as they, they get older. And if you have a very young wine, um, it's gonna be one shade, which is the center shade all the way out, and then nuanced in between there. And this one to me shows just a little very mild uh, difference in color, more of a dilute version of the same color at the edge than not. As I swirl my glass around, um, I'll notice two things. Number one, as I pull it down, uh, there is a very soft amount of staining uh, in the glass, in the tiers themselves as they move down sort of moderate, uh, moderate to moderate plus in, in length. And they do have a touch of staining there, which again suggests darker pigmentation of the grape and a little bit more concentration of, in the case of reds, particularly uh, grape skin slash must to juice ratio, higher volume, or as Tim likes to call it, that higher dry extract character, which is going to give you a uh, bigger richness there. So I'm expecting oomph as I go into this glass. Uh, when I smell it, I am not disappointed. Uh, and I'm getting this wonderful um, complexity of wines. By the way, this wine to when I opened it to now has changed so dramatically 
over time, I can't tell you. And by the way, if you ever, you're sitting here bored or whatever, go back to glass of wine number two, check in on that Gruner again. I think it will open your eyes as to how much potential that wine has down the pipeline for those of you who want to stick a few bottles away in your cellar. Anyway, I digress. F-E-W. What do you got in terms of fruit here? Well, the fruit is a nice combination of, of ripe red and black fruit. There's nothing blue here in that sort of boysenberry, blueberry vein. And that's a very unique genre of fruit, fruit to uh, certain styles of grapes, of which <laughs> the grapes that this wine is made of isn't one of them. But you do get red fruit here. You get extremely ripe raspberry. You get extremely ripe strawberry, some ripe red cherry as well. Uh, and pushing in from a condition standpoint to somewhere between ripe and almost sort of a jammy-ish compote-like character. Not heavy, not desserty, not confected, but just really dense, really, really uh, powerful. In the black fruit area, I'm getting a little bit of black raspberry, a little bit of black cherry. Once again, a little bit of red and black plum there. Uh, just a lot of really uh, rich and again, very ripe character of fruit. However, I wouldn't tell you that the fruit, big as it is, is what's dominant in this wine. As far as earth goes, once again, I am picking up a slight stoniness or um, terroir type element there that reflects itself not only in terms of like the smell of stones or turned dirt or earth or something like that, but also there's sort of like an underbrushy character there, sort of the, if you were walking out uh, in an area where you had a lot of, um, I don't know, uh, wild herbs or or, or um, underbrush or, or things like that, you get that sort of smell emanating in in the air wildflower smells emanating in the in the air uh, spicy smells emanating in the air so i find that too um mm -hmm. i'm finding some uh again uh, red and black licorice tim's last wine was more red licorice this has a little bit of both which also sort of by default takes me into the world of fennel just a hair and then there's kind of a nice pepperiness uh sort of green uh green peppercorn black peppercorn sort of character olivey dare I say, tapenade between your olives and your uh, black, black pepper and all that other sort of stuff coming on there and uh, a real richness and just begging under the back there, there's a current of like cured meat or uh, or meatiness to the wine, a sort of slightly uh, feral character that's really, really appealing. In the palate, the wine has got a good, fairly forward attack, how it hits me when it goes into my mouth. Uh, it carries all the way through. I was expecting the wine to be perhaps a bit more tannic and hard. And this wine is actually quite round and relatively creamy in texture, although there's good tannic grip there to it. It's very tasty. And everything that I smelled before is sort of echoing uh, in the palate. The only thing is I'm picking up a little bit more on that sort of herbal, spicy, uh, character and a little bit of that meaty character more in the palate uh, than I did in the nose where I think the fruit was uh, was still a bit uh, primary and dominant. I think that those characters will get even bigger as the wine ages and the fruit dissipates a little bit and more of those non-fruit aromas uh, come to the back. Uh, the body on it is probably in the medium full range. The acid on it is probably medium plus. I wouldn't put it at high, but I wouldn't call it perfectly balanced. It has a little grip and a little bit of lift there. It's extremely well made and uh, lengthwise, in medium plus, I uh, wouldn't call it super long, certainly not like the white one I tasted earlier, but it definitely doesn't just sort of ring hollow there. And it's got wonderful concentration and volume in the middle palate. So our choices are as follows. We have Cabernet Franc uh, as a single variety or part of a blend. Cabernet Franc being what you might see in um, the right bank of Bordeaux. You might find it in the Loire Valley. You might find it increasingly in other parts of the world where Cabernet Franc seems to be a grape that um, does really well around the world if you find the right place for it. We have Syrah uh, as a pure varietal or as part of a blend. And we all know that Syrah gives you a lot more of that black fruit, some of those spicy notes, et cetera, pepperiness character. Sangiovese, and Sangiovese can be relatively quiet, like a basic Chianti, but it can be quite loud, as in a Brunello or a Vino Nobile di Montepulciano or something like that. Again, sort of spicy, a bit more umami than tomato leafy at the same time, and maybe not quite as um, rich in fruit. But nevertheless, if it was blended with other grape varieties, it could pick that up. And then we have our other. And as we connect our dots, 
Uh, France could certainly participate in the first two characters there of Cabernet or Syrah. Italy certainly could be in the all three as well. The Syrah is not a regular grape for use over there. It can be used in blends. Cabernet Franc, not a regular grape over there, but again, as more blends. So ask yourselves to what point, if those grapes are dominant, maybe not as likely for Italy. California can do all of them um, and do all of them pretty darn well. I might add too, maybe, eh, maybe not the Sangiovese. We're getting better though. We are getting better. And then last but not least, uh, you have Australia, which does all of those grapes too, although Cabernet there, Franc wise, really being more of a secondary grape, not a lead grape, and Sangiovese um, being a grape they haven't probably figured out yet, but they do a lot of that Shiraz stuff. So, so a couple of I different think, angles. I think there's a backslide here, people. It used to be at 70%, and now we're hovering at 40, 50%. Um, I wonder if, and you can put this in chat, are red wines more difficult for you in the audience than white wines uh, to guess? It'd be interesting to see if there is a difference because I, there's definitely a slowdown, if you will, in voting. Um, but that said- That's Friday yeah. afternoon too. Maybe people just want to listen. <laughs> That's okay There, here we, go. So there we go. This, so where are we? we are. Yeah, so so Cap Franc got a got a little bit of love, but I would suggest to you that you're probably not quite as um, green and herbal and pyrazinic as Cabernet Franc as a variety would be. Cabernet Franc, as you can um, probably guess, is one of the um, the parents of Cabernet Sauvignon, which, when conflated with Sauvignon Blanc, gave you Cabernet Sauvignon and that sort of pyrazinic character that you get both in. Um, Sauvignon Blanc and in Cabernet Franc, of course, gives you a little bit of that. Syrah blend, um, sort of neck and neck with Sangiovese. For Sangiovese, it would be a fairly um, specific style. As I said before, generally, they tend to not be as deeply colored or deeply uh, volumed as this, with the exception perhaps of in uh, Montalcino but nevertheless, it could be. And then France, of course, and Italy reflected in your choices there. And um, a nod to the fact that, that, that Italy could do some of those other varieties as well. Not a lot of you who are in the Syrah world um, went Australian, which is interesting because there are some cooler climate areas that produce uh, Shiraz in Australia that make wines that are very uh, Rhone-like, uh, Northern Rhone-like in character, uh, but nevertheless, we shall see. I guess we'll see when we uh, when we find out where the plane takes off and lands. Um, Evan, as we're doing that, um, Akeem here has an interesting comment. As soon as I tasted the wine, I thought carbonic maceration stem clusters really felt the tannins from the stems. Did you feel the tannins from the stems on this one? Uh, and, and this to me doesn't come off as a wine. It has some tannic grip, but if you were really picking the tannic grip from from uh, from, from additions of, of jacks and whole clusters and all that, it would probably be bigger. That said, you can have, you know, 10 or 15% of uh, clusters in there or something and pick up a little bit. The carbonic to me, you know, is if you're going to have um, whole clusters or any sort of thing where you throw fruit in in its entirety, by definition, some of that fruit is going to be non-broken um, up. And ergo, you're going to have at least a semi-carbonic uh, character in there, once again, predicated on how much of a volume of that fruit there is being thrown in literally as whole clusters into the press. By definition of this one, I would say it's probably that fruit character is more driven by climate um, and ripeness factor than it is probably by production factor. Sure, our, our Google Earth going kind of crazy here. Yeah, and we ended up in France. Uh, so we didn't end up in Australia. We didn't end up in Italy. We ended up in uh, France in the southern Rhone Valley, not too far away from the little town of uh, Gigondas in the southern Rhone at Chateau Saint Gomme, Chateau de Saint Gomme. And um, I am a uh, gargantuan fan of what these folks do over there. Uh, this is a fabulous property that's been around since, I don't know, you know, 17. Actually, it's been around as a property since 1750. They've been growing land or growing grapes on this property since 1570. And it's now in its 14th generation of family ownership with the Bajoal uh, family. Uh, today, um, they're just continuing along. Louis is doing a great job 
over there. And they are, as I said before, in the area of Gigundas. Uh, and they are one of the oldest established properties in the region. The Southern Rhone in general is one of the oldest parts of France. Again, if you continuation, if you go back to the times of the Pope and uh, even before that, the Romans, there are dotted Roman amphitheaters in the Southern Rhone from Nîmes to Arles to other places. Uh, obviously, you work further uh, east as you get to the to Gigundas and places like that. Uh, this is a great um, property in terms of its ownership. They also own a property in Vansorbe in Chateau Durand. And they're also Louis's partners, interestingly enough, you want your weird factoid of the day. If any of you are familiar with Forge Cellars in Seneca in the Finger Lakes, he's a partner in that winery too, um, which is quite cool with Rick Rainey. They do that as a, as a side project, or I should say it's probably Louis's side project. It's probably Rick's primary project, although they do cross-pollinate across the wineries. What's interesting about this wine um, is whereas the wine they make from Vansorbe at Rouen and the wines that they make at Chateau uh, de Saint-Combe uh, are specifically made uh, from Gigondas and stuff like this. This wine, just the Les Deux Albions, we can move forward and we can see the label and everything, um, Li Mang, that would be great. Um, this is a wine that is part of a new project that they started in 1997, which is more of a negotiant project. So rather than growing all of the fruit themselves, they're actually purchasing the fruit and uh, making it from other people's fruit, but they're all very well established, contracted uh, particular players in three of the village in the Côte du Rhône village, one being uh, in Plan de Dieu, one being in Saint-Maurice and the third area being in Quiron. Uh, all of those areas known um, for their ability to do that. Liman, can we move to the next slides? Oh. I am moving and it's not The moving. map is just happy being there. There you go. So you have Louis on the, yeah, uh, there. Sorry. Now you have the, the, the property itself there, which looks like a chateau. Les Deux Albions, um, I did a lot of digging. I couldn't find out a specific reason why it is called that. Um, but nevertheless, um, we're all happy that they do. And I think this wine is just, you know, a wonderful confluence of, you know, that character I talked about before of that sort of underbrushiness of um, thing they call garrigue in that part of the world, which is sort of uh, herbs and flowers and underbrush and all of that. You have a little bit of thyme, a little bit of lavender and violet. There's a very strong purple character, both dried and fresh there. And then this interesting note, because this wine has spent a little bit, I mean, parts of it has spent a little bit of time in oak. And give you um, uh, just a nut of almost like gingerbread or something like that in there. Not as sweet as sort of your toffee, coffee, chocolatey thing. And a little bit spicier, cinnamony, gingerbready, but still baking spicy in a good regard. Round, rich, delightful. And as a straight Cote de um, which this wine is labeled as, uh, I think this wine could age. I mean, I would put it away easily for, for four or five years. I think it'll age beautifully. And it demonstrates um, Louis's uh, qualities as a really brilliant winemaker in doing it with a fairly modest wine. His sort of single estate properties in Van Sorb and uh, Gigondas really give you the sense of what they're able to do uh, at the more top end. Great. Sorry about that, some technical difficulty, yeah, but let's catch up, Tim. Wine five. Yeah, yeah, just a couple of parting thoughts. You know, Evan, first of all, I'm two weeks from today. I will be in Lyon. So mm, I'm going on a, nice. a river cruise of the Rhone from Lyon to Arles. Yes, Fabulous. I'm looking forward. It's the second time I've done it. And, uh, you know, you know Cote de Rhone like this is one of my very favorite red wine values on the planet because you have a wine that could be declassified Chateauneuf or Gigondas, but it's made by someone who has really high skills, but also really good vineyard material. Mm -hmm. And so the value proposition on these wines can be off the charts. And to me, not only that, the delicious factor, you know, this wine to me is just, it's just wonderful. Okay, onward. Now for something completely different as they say on TV. So let's take a look at the questions, first of all. And the first one, like my uh, my previous red wine, has to do with, you know, look at the depth of color and what does that tell you about the potential grape variety? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, number two, what are the important non-fruit aromas? And here again, I'm harping on this because, again, all wine has fruit and the type of fruit is generally agreeable versus dark versus red, et cetera, et cetera. But you may get different things from us. That's perfectly fine. But the non-fruit aromas are important in a lot of those you could literally in a lab, you know, isolate them chemically, right? And they're important. And then finally, how does the wine structural levels once again reflect where the grapes were grown? 
Okay, that's important. So let's take a look at the wine, just like Li Ming is doing against the white background. The wine's very deep in color. It's opaque. You can't read through it. And I'm going to call this a very deep, opaque ruby. And if you take a look at the rim, the rim is like a really deep uh, fuchsia or purple, right? So we've got a thicker skin, great variety, a lot of pigmentation, and it's relatively speaking, it's young. All right, what else? Uh, the legs, tears, on and on and on is probably high. Half my glass is on vacation. It's not doing <laughs> And, and again, if I do this very slowly, uh, you know, the wine staining the glass. And again, connecting the dots, you would expect that with a wine with so much saturation of color. Okay, on to the nose. Mmm, wow. Okay, it just smells quality. Okay, and, and I'll get to that in a second. So there's a lot of intensity on the nose and the fruit is very pure. Uh, it's predominantly dark fruit, right? So black cherry, Cassis, uh, currant, black currant, and uh, black plum. There's also some red fruit too, but it's in the background. And there's red currant and red plum and red cherry here, but predominantly it's black fruit, okay? The condition is ripe and fresh. And then uh, the non-fruit, starting with floral, there's a, there's a really pretty violet top note and a little bit of rose, and those are fresh, but a really strong sense of violet. And then, hmm, Okay, the wine is herbal, it's green, okay, and pyrazines. So I've got bell pepper, um, I've got a little grassiness, a little, a little bit of laurel, uh, a little bit of sage. It's really quite green and herbal, and that's interesting paired with really ripe fruit too, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of earth and mineral, I think both are there. There is a turned soil, uh, loamy type quality, and there's also a little bit of what I would call chalk dust, but it's a very, very minor player. Uh, and some mushroom along to go along with that, only a darker mushroom. There's definitely oak usage. And with a wine with this much color, I would expect it because you're talking probably wine that's very concentrated. That oak would do it a lot of favors in terms of evening out the tannins. If there's as much tannin as I expect, we'll find out, okay? Uh, the oak makes itself known in terms of vanilla, sweet spices, cinnamon, nutmeg particularly, but also in bitter walnut, bitter nut quality. And uh, what else? Well, that's really about it. So I'm going to taste it for the structure. Mm. Wow. That's delicious, right? <laughs> it really is. That's a high quality wine. Okay. The fruit is all very pure black currant and black cherry and red currant to me. Very pure fruited. Um, the structure, the wine is dry. The alcohol is high. The acid is medium plus. Very interesting. We can talk about that after the fact. And the tannins are medium plus plus, right? But they're very refined tannins. And here, that's where my comment about the use of oak really helps tannin here. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's kind of counterintuitive and we can talk about it after the fact. The finish is long. The complexity is medium plus plus. Uh, the wine is superbly made. What is so impressive about it is that it is a grape variety and that should have more tannin generally. And yet the texture of the wine and the tannin management are just superb. So we'll talk about that more after the fact. But here are your choices on the ballot. We have Sangiovese and Blend. We have Cabernet Sauvignon and Blend. And we have Syrah and Blend. And those are three completely different universes. So if you're going Sangiovese, you're vo voting, of course, for Tuscany and Italy. If it's Cabernet Sauvignon, depending on how much earth and mineral there is, you may go to France with it, or you may go to other places in the New World, and those being Australia or the US. And then finally, Syrah Blend, you could be in France once again, depending on the earth and mineral qualities, or you could be in Australia, or you could be even be in the US. Okay, lots of choices. All right, so cast your votes and let's see what we have. And I'm gonna take another sip and I'm just gonna swallow some of this because this is <laughs> really good. You know, I, I found all the wines today have a very strong tastiness factor. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're, you know, with the exception of arguably the wine number two, which is a little bit more cerebral, all these wines yeah. today just, really quote unquote, taste good. Yeah. It's not that the second one doesn't. I did, I did close the poll a little earlier. So for those of you who didn't kill fast enough, faster fingers next time. 
Uh, in the meantime, we do have a majority of folks going towards that Cabernet, Tim. Yeah. And then firmly, I would say firmly in the new world between Australia and USA. Yeah, yeah. all right. So, so uh, good on everybody for that. Uh, let's talk about the other possibilities real quickly. So Sangiovese, the blend, frankly, uh, unless it had another grape in the blend, wouldn't have the step of color, right? And it certainly wouldn't have a purple rim, even when young. It just shows oxidation. The acid would be higher. The tannin would be higher. There would be more dried fruit qualities and more dried everything else about it, okay? And it would be earthy. Uh, this wine is not that earthy. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, yes. And we're going to talk about where it's from in a second. Syrah blend, well, you just tasted one in, in wine number four. And a lot of Syrah and that Cote de Rhone and the pepper and the savory and everything Evan was talking about, uh, all that delicious savory, dried meat, sanguine type qualities are lacking here. What you do have are the pyrazines. And so then you have to ask yourself, okay, it's got high alcohol, okay? How tannic is it? And frankly, how pyrazenic is it? And the answer, it's pretty green. And then how often do you come across California Cabernet with this much of a pyrazenic character? And the answer is not very often, okay? I also have to talk about the tannin management here and just the textural qualities as being really about as good as it gets for Cabernet. So let's see where we are in the world and we'll connect the dots. And, uh, you know, Evan, this is a producer I didn't know. And it was like the delightful surprise of the fly for me. <laughs> that's, well, that's a you hard know? thing to do to find a wine you haven't had before. Yeah, but... I mean, I'm a huge fan of other producers in the area, you know. Um, and Great. I didn't know this one. And, and man, is it good. Yeah. She is really good, Heather. Yeah. 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 I, so I, here we are. Go ahead. We're, we're going to go a long ways. Across, oh, doing it again. Uh -huh. across two oceans or many oceans uh, to actually a place in Australia that is remote, even for Australia, because if you're in Adelaide, it's actually a four hour flight to Perth. And then it's about four or five hours in the car south from the city to get to on the west coast, uh, the region of Margaret River. And Margaret River is known for Lewin Estate. Certainly that is you know, the winery with Robert Mondavi's help, who in the late 60s planted his flag and said, this is a great region for wine with a lot of potential. Uh, uh, Voss Felix is here, one of my favorite wineries in Australia, Heather Wilcox. I mean, Virginia Wilcox, she's amazing. And here we have a small winery that's called Ringbolt. And Ringbolt, it's very near the coast. In fact, this whole, I didn't know this, but the history of, of the west coast of Australia involves a lot of shipwrecks. It's very treacherous sailing. And there's actually a bay that came to be known as Ringbolt because there's this shipwreck, an 18th century shipwreck of a ship called the Ringbolt. Hence the mm -hmm. name of the winery. This is he uh, Heather Frazier. She started the wine winery in 2001. Uh, mm -hmm. She makes Cabernet Sauvignon. And like the other producers, unlike the other producers, I should say in Margaret River, she only makes Cabernet Sauvignon. Mm -hmm. That's her specialty. And uh, look, there's kangaroos and vineyards, and the vineyards I, do I, not. I'm like sad Maddie fruits. isn't here for that photo, but she yeah, would have appreciated they, that. <laughs> yeah, they don't like the kangaroos because the kangaroos eat all the grapes, right? And there are actually <laughs> open seasons for kangaroo in Australia. I know that is like terrible, but it's true. Okay, so what else can we say about this? Uh, average age of the vines here is of between 20 and 25 years. Uh, this wine only sees 25% new oak. The soils here are loam and clay. And uh, if anything, you see the proximity to the ocean and, you know, not a huge diurnal, but, you know, the sea breezes, which keep the vines healthy and disease free, but just the ripening curve is slow, you know, certainly slower than other parts of Australia that were known for Cabernet. And to me, you get a depth of fruit and a purity of fruit that just, it screams Cabernet Sauvignon plus the pyrazine quality. And uh, kudos to her. This is really delicious wine. Yep, absolutely. Okay, we had a question here very quickly because we are running out of time. Mm. Can you distinguish between California and uh, Australia and Cab Salt? Yeah, Ben Cap, that's a great question. Two things. First of all, structure. Generally speaking, areas that produce Cabernet in California that you know already really well, like Napa Valley, Sonoma County, et cetera, they are warmer than Margaret River and the alcohols are higher. The fruit is riper, sometimes into the overripe raisiny type stage. 
and the wines are just bigger and more tannic, right? Here you've got a wine also, and one more thing, the pyrazines. I mean, like I said, in, in these places in California, unless it's a cooler year, which happens, but not too often, you don't get pyrazines like this. And, uh, I, and you know, pyrazines to me are a hallmark of Australian Cabernet from Coonawara or from Margaret River. And then what else about it? You know, again, just it's, to me, it's a more elegant expression. It's just not as rich and ripe and it's mm -hmm. not as tannic. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, Evan, let's get straight into wine number six, please. Yeah, just a quick segue to finish out what Tim was saying, and I'll jump into wine number six, because um, I think that's a really good question. First of all, uh, it's not, you know, saying California Cabernet and Australian Cabernet are two immense uh, characters. In Napa Valley, as we know, tastes very different than Sonoma County. Um, and what you find in, say, I don't know, Barossa Valley is going to be very different than what you find there. Margaret River is an interesting area in the sense that it's probably the most Bordeaux-like of all Cabernet places in the world that is not Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. So if you are looking for, if you're a big fan of Bordeaux and you want to venture out and try something different, training wheels into the new world, this is a good place to start because you're going to find flavor profile similarities and structural, as, as Tim said, climate-wise uh, similarities are going to be more like that. The other thing I just wanted to make mention because it just dawned on me as I was retasting wine number four, I neglected to mention to everybody that even though this is a Cote de Rhone, it has a higher com a higher quantity of Syrah in it than it does Grenache, which in and of itself is incredibly unusual, uh, but nevertheless is why you had both the round texture, but that grip from the, the Syrah at the same time. And as much of the Syrah markers as you did that juicy sort of ripe red and black fruit that you would expect um, from ripe Grenache. So anyway, let's move into wine six on that one. Uh, you're very familiar with the with the questions at this point in time. As uh, Tim said earlier, we always sort of look at the, the way red fruit manifests itself or red wine fruit as either red, black, or blue. Red fruit generally coming from cooler climate areas, black fruit usually coming from warmer areas, blue fruit from somewhere in the middle, but in very uniquely um, interesting parts of the world. So ask yourself as you're smelling that, what do you find here? Uh, warmer, cooler climate, that'll be as much about structure, weight, uh, acidity, et cetera, and the nature of the tannins, tannin firmness. And then when you get to those tannins, we'll ask ourselves the texture of them. So the color itself is not as deep as the last wine we had, but probably a little bit more than the Rhone, probably about around the same thing as the Rhone, fairly consistent color, again, sort of a nice uh, mid ruby, a little bit fading towards the edge, uh, not a lot of extraction of color in the tears very light and the tears running eh, moderately plus. I mean, they're not, they're not, they're somewhere in the middle. They're not slow, but they're certainly not fast. Uh, most importantly is our nose, main event. I'm getting a wine here that is probably driven by uh, earthier and more, more truffly, mushroomy, uh, turned earth uh, type characters than I am fruit. The fruit that is there is definitely more savory in nature. So I actually think the things that jump out to me as much, and remember tomato is a fruit, but this is more like really good cherry tomatoes, red currants, currants are, are more vegetal than they are sweet. There is some plum, there is some cassis, but you're noticing that I'm not picking up any of the super high tone red fruits or black fruits there. There is some sort of dusty cherry character there, but it's all sort of more in that savory spectrum of fruit. Uh, the floral character here is definitely rose, but I would say it's rose fresh and rose dried is in the part of a potpourri. Some greens for sure, uh, call it chard, call it maybe a little bit of escarole or something like that. Again, this sort of truffly, mushroomy, porcini, sep type of character. And uh, an interesting, again, minerality. Uh, actually a little bit of salinity, interesting. To check that out a little bit later on. And some oak, uh, pronouncing itself probably here more as, as kind of a co cocoa powder, maybe coffee, maybe walnut skin type of character, a bit of bitterness to it, all of those elements being um, primarily bitter. And then in the mouth. Wine is bright. The acidity is medium plus, wouldn't call it high, but definitely medium plus and certainly not medium. The tannins on them are present. I would call them medium plus. I actually think that the quality of tannins, the volume of tannins is pretty much the same in this wine as it was in Tim's Cabernet. The only difference here is these are being more traditionally, more astringent, more drying, more um, medium sandpaper as opposed to the fine-grained 
sandpaper that Tim had in his last Cabernet, but equally present. Um, the, the structure there uh, finishes long. Uh, palette is medium, uh, medium, medium to medium plus in body. Wine is quite tasty, but it's definitely more nuanced uh, as opposed to the sheer volume that we had in either of wines four and five. Quite tasty, very savory by definition. You're coming off literally two more fruit driven styled wines prior. This wine is definitely more savory. Uh, dare I use the word umami ish like in style, along with a combination of fruit characters that we have. In terms of fruit, Think about the fruit choices that you have in front of you. Gamay, uh, we, again, we know from Beaujolais, although there's some very successful Gamays made up in Oregon and even in California these days, but it tends to be very much on a fruit-driven thing and usually a very red fruit-driven thing. Cabernet Sauvignon, you have where you just came from today. There are definitely similarities uh, in genre there. Tempranillo, that could be an interesting one. That's the grape, of course, that we find in Spain and Portugal, uh, which the name changes and the style changes depending where you are, but they can be more savory by definition and can speak to a lot there. But there's a couple of choices there, and obviously you've got your appropriate geography placements alongside to think about your mix and match profiles that you have. I wonder sometimes, Evan, if they think about your psyche when you make these selections in a row. Would Evan put, you know, <laughs> four old worlds, six old worlds? What is his sort of, you know, I, I certainly know that you, when you're double blind tasting, it's hard not to look for these clues, right? Yeah, yeah. No, you sure. Know? And I think anybody who's done blind tasting before, particularly if you're coming in program, you're sort of anticipating some level of balance across varieties. Yeah. across uh, old world and new world geographies. And I do believe in doing that. And if you've been tasting with us before, you usually note that in a typical kit, you're going to get a handful of different varieties. You're going to get a handful of different geographies. But I do think at times it's important to instructively to show people different takes uh, yeah. on different things to show them comparatively how something can express itself in an area that's different. We call that terroir or artistic interpretation or something. That was just a big hint. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think the it's great. I think you have to rely on the wine itself, right? And sometimes we we overthink it by saying, I wonder what Evan's thinking. <laughs> it's like that wonderful uh, initial short story that Roald Dahl wrote before he wrote James and the Giant Peach, uh, which is all about, you know, a guy who's trying to, to gain the thing to marry somebody's daughter. And he looks for wine clues around the house and ends up picking the wrong wine because of clues. <laughs> Don't overthink it. Let the wine Don't speak to you. It. Let the All wine right, talk let's to you. see where folks are at. I'm going to share these results. All right. Oh, interestingly, I, I, and, and I can get this. Actually, Tim will probably address this a little bit afterwards on, on sometimes why you can do it. Lion's share of people here went for Tempranillo, and I can actually see that. I can understand why you went there and we can talk about it a little bit more. And clearly those Tempranillo choices almost all universally went to Spain. A uh, few people yeah. went to Cabernet and went to Italy. A few people went to Cabernet and probably based on the numbers, well, they could have gone to Spain too. There's some good Cabernet in the Benedis area, for example, and in Catalonia. But um, we ended up there. Nobody in Gamay, nobody in France, nobody went to Australia, um, thinking that you wouldn't get two Australian wines in a row probably. All right, yeah, let's find out where go. we are and then let's talk about it. It's great to have a wine to finish on that, that evokes and provokes conversation. We like that. So we're going to get up, leave our, our friends in the... By the way, this is a beautiful part of the world. If you can ever get to Western Australia, and Tim alluded to the fact that it takes about a day and a half to get there <laughs> from just about anywhere, yes. depending on flights, puddle hoppers, long car drives, et cetera. It is a beautiful spot yeah. on earth. And interestingly, as you can see on the map right now, it's um, covered by water on three sides. So you do get this very strong maritime influence climate, which preserves the acidity, which keeps the growing season longer. And it's just an incredibly underrated part of the world. But we're heading back. We're going back up to the Northern hemisphere. We're going back over. We're gonna hover and all that. And people are going, heaven, we're not going to Spain. Evan, we're not going to Spain. Our plane got hijacked. Our plane the got boot. hijacked and we are landing in Italy. And we are landing in Tuscany. And you're sort of, sort of saying to yourself, well, Evan, if we were ending up in Tuscany, why wasn't Sangiovese a choice there? Because we are specifically enter, entering an area called the Bulgari, Bulgari being on the uh, western coast of Tuscany. Tuscany is a pretty big area. We tend to uh, myopically look at it through the prism of just you know two or three Appalachians, but Bulgari 
uh, is a hot player in this day and age, more towards the coastal areas, more towards the uh, waters you can see there on the map. And we are uh, there. So this area of Bulgaria um, is one of the two spots that's right on the, I mean, you can see it there on the, you're literally on the coastal area there. And it was sort of discovered. It was discovered pretty much back in the uh, 80s, if you will, or early 80s. And it's one of the first two wineries is there. Actually, this was arguably the first vineyard plantings was there. This was planted in 1977 by a gentleman named Piero Calva Cavalati, Cavala Cavalata, something like that. C's, V's, T's, I'll have to look it up later. But Piero started this winery and he sold it some couple of decades later to the Bertarelli family. And, and although this winery, Gratamaco, is primal in this area, it's often overshadowed by its, its neighbor, uh, San Guido, Tenuta San Guido makes this little wine called Sasakaya. Some of you probably heard about it before, which really uh, put this appellation on the map, although technically they weren't first. What is interesting about this area? Well, whereas we think of Tuscany as being basically over written everywhere by San Giovese. This is an area where Bordeaux varieties reign supreme. In fact, you cannot have more, if you even wanted to, than 50% Sangiovese in the wine. And the balance of the wine is going to be in other varieties. And they're almost always, well, they are always Bordelais varieties, most notably Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. And if you've had Sassicaia before, you're well aware of it. What's interesting about where this particular property, Gratamaco, sits, as you can tell, Kind of hard to tell, but you can tell, I guess, a little bit that you're at a slightly higher altitude um, than you are in some of the other places. You're actually a little bit closer to the water, although you can't really see it there. And because of that and the thermal amplitude, this actually provides good conditions for Sangiovese. So they generally have um, the highest percent of Sangiovese you know, globally, if you will, regionally, if you will, of their wines. Uh, in this particular case, it's 10% in this vintage, along with 30% Cabernet Sauvignon, 30% uh, Merlot, 25% Cabernet Franc, so 85% classic Bordeaux varietals, which is generally the rule of thumb here, 10% Sangiovese and 5% Petit Verdot, which finishes with a Bordeaux thing. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the owner, the Tipa Bertarelli uh, family that I talked about before that purchased this winery back in 2002, and Luca Marone, who's the winemaker there today. These guys always do a fabulous job, and I think they're just sort of not as known because, you know, Sasakaya sucks up all of the air in the room, but there are other producers throughout Bulgaria who are doing just um, an amazing job of which these guys are one of them. They're also known for being a little bit iconoclastic, not just with the San Giovese thing, but back in 1986, they planted Vermentino in this area as well too, and actually make a delicious Vermentino, which I don't think I would ever put it in one of these classes. Well, you never say never, but it's not a variety and a place that you would associate together and you'd all send me hate mail after that. And I don't want you to do that. But Bulgaria is a place you should know. Bordeaux style wines coming off of the Western coast of Tuscany are wines you should know. Even though you may not be examined about them, they have a very firm place and standing in the fine wine pantheon. And as such, it's appropriate that we put them in. Uh, these guys do a tremendous job. And I just thought this wine was delicious when I tried it put it in and ergo we have it. But Tim, before we close out here, because it's a really good point and very fundamental based on the voting, talk with us a little bit about that evil twin thing of Tem Tempranillo and Sangiovese and why oftentimes they do get confused. Yeah, thanks, Evan. You know, it, more often than not, they get confused because they have a similar fruit quality, predominantly red, uh, in for a Grand Reserve of Rioja, for instance, I mean oxidized, and in County Classico, Sangiovese shows an oxidative character. So you will get oxidative type red fruit and maybe even ripe. How they're different, I mean, Sangiovese just has higher acid and it even shows up in this wine and, and then tannin, right? And the Sangiovese also makes itself known in this because there's, there's great tannin in the front of the mouth, which you frankly don't get that much. I mean, taste this, you know, to uh, next to the Australian Cabernet and they're like different universes. Uh, this wine by comparison is profoundly earthy, it's acidic, and there's tannin in the front of the mouth, which is just for a Cabernet blend is just crazy, you don't find it. So that's the Sangiovese talking. And, and then, you know, for Tempranillo type blends, I mean, there's certainly elevated acid that balances the wine, but the wines just aren't that tannic. Unless, of course, if you go outside in other places like the Ribera del Duero, then it can be, but generally it's not. Evan, did you say how much percentage of Sangiovese was in this Cabernet blend? 10. 
Yeah. 10 yeah. Percent. yeah, typically they use between 10 and 15 at Gratamaco, which already, even though that doesn't sound like a lot, that's already more than most everybody else. Most no. people don't put any, even though you're allowed to go up to 50%, most people put in very little, if any, mm -hmm. and more and more of them just use the Bordeaux varieties. Now, this, of course, creates, as we close here, this great sort of, you know, um, existential discussion in Italy, which is why you even allow these varieties in there in the first place when you have Italian varieties, when the whole super Tuscan category, of course, was created uh, by the Tuscans, generally more inland, generally more towards towards Chianti and all that. There, it was it was a renegade group, and many of them for the longest period of time, because of that, forego their ability to use traditional appellations because you weren't able to uh, to put these grapes in there. A laws have since been amended to allow for certain percentages to come in here, but this is very much forward thinking and very much um, renegade thinking in that regard. So I wonder what go. people think. We have a, we have Christy that said, I love this red, but uh, maybe in a happy half hour, Evan and I will be hosting that. And so let us know what you think of the wines. I'm going to close here with, of course, Tim's book. If you still haven't got it, why don't you have it? It's an amazing book. Um, and then Evan and I will be hosting a 5 p.m. session, 5 p.m. Pacific, which is 8 p.m. East Coast. For those of you who have dinner, you need to put kids to bed um, on May 4th. Uh, which is a Sunday. Thursday. Mm -hmm. It's a Thursday just before Cinco de Mayo. So we're like your party before your party. Uh, it is a food and wine uh, pairing discussion. And if you received our email yesterday, and we'll send another one to remind everybody, um, there are some treats uh, snacks that Evan is recommending that you bring along. So that would truly be, we're going to explore kit 133. This QR code gets you there. We will sell out of this. So definitely get that sooner rather than later. And May 4th is really coming up. Um, and then the next kit is 142. I know that uh, we had some very upset customers who said that they couldn't get 141. Um, and so make sure if you want 142, the webinar kit is now on sale on our website. 